Uh, the last thing before we jump into the message, if you'll notice, we do, by the way, we have a really nice library downstairs. It's been completely remodeled, wonderful books. They're curated, they're kept, um, kept um, in order. It's a great place. And every week, so Jennifer, bless her, who is our librarian, oh, right over here, so we have this main cafe, we have this foyer, and then there's a hallway. There is a small bookcase there, and every week she's going to put books there that she thinks will fit well with the subject matter. For instance, if I recommend some books, you're going to try to have them there, or, or books that are related to the messages. So if you think, hey, I want to know more, I want to learn more, and granted, you know, I only have like 45 or 55 or an hour and a half of uh, message time. Just kidding. Okay, I just have limited time up here, and there's lots more to be said on so many of these topics. And so those books are going to be available to you as we have them, and she buys more books. So that's a really good resource for anyone who wants to take advantage of that. Okay, so this morning, as noted, is our last installment of our series, and I am grateful for the wonderful work, work of Dr. R Rebecca McLaughlin, who has put together the book that we have been using as a guide as we go through Scripture to tackle some very good questions. Uh, me here as your pastor is very grateful for how many of you have purchased the book. We sold about 50 or so of these books and they've gone to various places. And again, I want to encourage you to read it because you, if you're like me, you're going to forget lots of information and you can highlight, you can look at, you can review and that will help your faith and it will help equip you to engage with people in conversations in our community, in our world about these really important important subjects. Truth be told, I think the subject for today is the most important subject of all of the subjects in the book. Because as she goes through various aspects and questions that people ask about Christianity, it really leads to this question. And the question is, how could a loving God send people to hell? And it's an important Question, And so we're going to examine that, and I've broken it up in three parts because the question has three parts. The first part is, how could a loving God? So we need to talk about the God of love, what love means, and the nature of God. So that's our first um, focus point. The second focus point is, how can a loving God send people? So then we need to talk about the nature of people from the Scriptures. And then to hell. And so then we need to talk about the nature of eternity. Okay, so these are three massive subjects that I'm going to try to delve into in a quick type of fashion to help us to get our mind around what is being stated. Because often when people ask this question, there are some assumptions about love, assumptions about the nature of God and the nature of people and the nature of eternity. And so in order to answer that accurately and biblically, we need to look at the biblical text, understand what is being um, talked about, and then try to engage people if they are asking that question. And perhaps you in here have asked that question or currently are asking this question. So again, it is a significant question covering <laughs> massive topics that are of utmost importance. Okay, so here is the first point we're going to look at. Then I uh, am titling these The Divine, okay, get some labels in here, The Divine Nature of God. So that is the first main point under trying to respond to this very good question. So question, in my opinion, which I think is accurate, is based upon what I would say a faulty and incomplete understanding of both love and the nature of God. So in this question, it assumes that it is an unloving of God to hold people accountable for both their intentions or their motivations and their actions, right? So how could a loving God send people to hell, right? And so underlying to that is the assumption that it is unloving to hold people accountable. I would venture that I think the exact opposite is true. That it is because God 
loves that he holds people accountable for their intentions and actions. Now, for example, Scripture says, and this is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, and if you have your Bible, follow along. There's notes for you. Follow along, okay? Make sure that what I'm saying is in the context of Scripture, which I do believe it is, but you have to check these things out of me and all preachers or people who use the words themselves. So in Hebrews chapter 12, this is what we read. It says, the Lord disciplines those he, what's that word there? Loves. The Lord disciplines those he loves. It's not the Lord disciplines those he hates or those he doesn't care about or those he would rather not deal with or do away with. It says the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes every one who ex- he accepts as a son. So what this tells us is because, because God loves us, he disciplines and at times punishes us, okay, because of our actions and behaviors. Why? So we would learn to become and do what is both right and good and loving. And we see God doing this with his people all throughout Scripture. We see Jesus doing this with his disciples and the church. And if you read the book of Revelation where he's talking to the church, he does this as well. Now this is also true in our own families. It's because I love my children, I discipline them, right? And if you have children, you know this to be true, right? Sometimes in disciplining our children, it's harder on us than it is on them, right? Now, if they're grounded, we have to deal with that. If we need to discipline them in other ways, we have to deal with that. If I didn't care about our daughters, and we have two daughters who are now 24, no, 25, 24 and 25, right? When they were young, we disciplined them. Why? Is it because they hated them? Pfft. Exactly the opposite, because I love them, and I didn't want them to hurt themselves by running out on the street. So we told them, you cannot run out in the street, and if they decided to head in that direction, we disciplined them. We disciplined them when they um, hit each other or stole something or lied, right? We told them that it's not okay, and we told them why it's not okay. And then we helped them by some external um, motivations, okay, in the hopes that they would be internally motivated not to lie. We discipline our kids, and you know that intrinsically as a parent, right? because you love them. Now, if I didn't love my kids, I'd just let them do whatever they wanted all of the time, right? It would be um, chocolate and cotton candy for dinner every night, right? We would stay up running around in their diapers until they drooled and fell on themselves, right? Or whatever, right? It's been easy for me. I do what you want. I'm going to play my video games or whatever, right? So we know as parents, it's true. And we want to discipline our kids because we love and discipline them in love. And God, one of his favorite um, names for himself is Father. Why that was chosen is for many reasons, but one of them is defining the relationship of a good, healthy, loving, perfect, I want to say perfect divine father to his children. And so when people say, well, how can a loving God... um, send people or discipline people, send people to hell. How do you define love, right? Actually, I think it is loving to keep people accountable for their behavior. Also, when you think about love, how loving would it be for God to allow those 
who choose to abuse others to go free or have no consequences, right? Now, for instance, I'll just take an example again of my, of my two girls when they were younger. What if the older, Anna, came to Deborah, took her, took her doll, pulled her hair, then punched her and wa- ran off, right? Not that she wouldn't have done that, okay. Now, I love both my children, as you love your children as well. Right? How loving would it have been to Deborah, who in this illustration was violated per se, if I just said to Anna, well, I love you and you can do whatever you want because you're free to live your life how you want, young one. What if, what if, what if, what if Deborah would have heard me say that to Anna? How loving would have that been to Deborah? Not at all loving, right? So you're saying, oh, so you won't protect me, you don't watch over me, you won't hold other people accountable if they hurt me? How loving would I be if I didn't hold the one who violated the other, to account. So we understand that in that example, and we can extrapolate from that. Would it be loving for God if a horrendous thing happened to you? And I know many stories in this room where there has been very um, evil things that have taken place against you. Granted, we are to forgive, but also there is... Crime and punishment. There is an account from one who holds the authority as a parent, as the creator to give an account. I would say if God did not hold people accountable for their actions, their intentions, their evil, that he would be unloving. So when people ask this question, but how can a loving God hold people accountable, or send people to hell. We have to define what love is. I think it is absolutely because he loves that he holds people accountable for their actions and intentions. We're going to talk a little bit more of this. Now, second, with that, we have to couple with who God is. Okay? Who is... God. I skipped a, a passage of scripture for our support, but that's, you know what, I'm just going to, we're going to put it back in, okay? Pay attention to your notes, Dave, okay? This passage tells us about some of the nature of God. This is Romans chapter 2, verse 6 and 11, okay? Talking about his loving, talking about his justice. Romans 2, 6 through 11. It reads this way. He, which is God, will render to each one according to his or her works. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he or she will, uh, excuse me, he, God, will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be Wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. The Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. The Jew first and also the Greek, the non-Jew. For God shows no partiality. You and I will be grateful for a just judge. This is a judge that no one can bribe. This is a judge that no one can manipulate to um, turn the evidence in their favor. God makes it very clear that he will indeed hold people accountable for their actions, which means we can trust him, which means justice is ultimately in his hands which means that there is a God who loves, and because he loves, he holds people accountable. So stating that God is love is true, but it's also incomplete and becomes 
misleading. We have to understand God's nature, who he is in his totality. And if we say that God is more loving than he is holy, we misrepresent God. Or if we say God is more just than he is merciful, we misrepresent God. And saying, how can a loving God assumes that God's primary and perhaps only characteristic is love. And even if he, in his love, holds people accountable, it is right and good to do so. But that is not all that God is. In the end of your notes, there is a sheet that I put together, okay? God is. And hopefully at the end of this message, you can take that, you can put it someplace to remind you of things and attributes of God that are true of him. Does scripture say God is love? And we can say, of course. But scripture also says that God is a consuming fire. That God is a righteous judge. That God is mighty. God is a rock or of refuge. That God is holy. God is righteous. God is truthful. God is for us. God is faithful. God is just. He is not one thing more than other things. He's all of these things at the same time. That's why I say God's divine nature. I remember when I was uh, getting acquainted with the folks of Temple as they were considering a merge. And so I preached a message, and afterwards there was a, a question and answer time. And one of the questions asked of me was, what was my favorite attribute of God? My response was his perfection. <laughs> because in his perfection, he covers all of the attributes. So when we consider God, and if you say, well, God is love, yes, he is love, you're right, but he's also, again, holy. You remember what the angels say of God? Holy, holy. Holy, holy. Is he more holy than he is loving? Is he more just than he is merciful? He is all of those things and all of their meaning and all of their goodness. He is divine. He is perfect. And there is none like him. And how dare we try to define him with one attribute or quality. When Moses encountered God in a burning bush, right? And Moses asked, What's, who should I tell him that sent me? The best definition of God is, I am who I am. So we have to have a biblical understanding of who God reveals himself to be. We do injustice to God by just defining him, defining him with one of his attributes. We get off track. People who just define God solely as love, they go a certain direction often become very liberal. This is generalities, okay? Those who define God primarily by a God of justice become typically very legalistic. <laughs> my hope is for us in this congregation, my hope is for all Christians, that we would have a biblical understanding of the divine nature of God. That's why I gave you that list. That's why I'm asking you to look at it Memorize it. Let it impact who you are when you pray, who you are praying to. And when you appeal to God, who you are appealing to. And when you receive an invitation, who is giving you an invitation to come and follow me? 
So again, in order to answer the question, could a loving God send people to hell? We have to understand what love is and what means. We understand, have to understand who God is and what that means. So it will help us in understanding who this being is and putting that foundation in its right place allows us to interact with him and reverence him and honor him and submit ourselves to who God shows himself to be. Now, second big category, and I put another descriptor here. <laughs> the fallen nature of humanity. Okay. Put it right there in my title where I'm go- going with this. Right? We have the divine nature of God. And then his creation, in which we are the crown of his creation, has been marred and has fallen. So when God created humanity, if you read in Genesis, he called it what? Very good. Very good. It's good, it's good, it's good. Man alone is good, but not complete. Man and woman together, making of his image, that is very good good. He made this world very good, and he made us very good from the beginning, and we were innocent, and we were free of sin, and we had communion with our Creator, and perfect connection with one another, and a world that was free of the curse. Now, because love is not love if it is not chosen. A double negative. Love can only be love if someone chooses to love. You can't force someone to love you. You can't concoct a certain potion and put it in their drink in order for them to love you. If love is forced... It's not love. Part of the nature of love is it has to be chosen. The person has to voluntarily give themselves in relationship. God gave us this choice. God gave the crown of his creation the choice to love him by knowing him. Choosing to be with Him, honoring Him, trusting Him. This is how God set it up. Knowing Him for who He is, His good and right and worthy, of course, of love. Now, as Scripture records, we collectively, in both Adam and Eve, being in them, collectively, we chose To exchange the truth of God for a lie. And because of that choice, we have been put under a curse. (laughs) And then we personally, in turn, make the same choice because of our fallen nature. Collectively, in Adam and Eve, because we are in them, we, as they as representatives of the human race, chose to disobey God, exchange what they knew about God, God for a lie. Okay. A lot in there, I can't unpack that all. And then, as we are born now, we're given over to a curse, and this whole world is given over to a curse, and it groans, waiting to be redeemed, when all heaven and earth is redeemed, and the children of God are seen for who they are. There is a groaning of creation itself, and we have now been given over to a fallen nature, which we are bent towards disobedience, and we individually make the choice to exchange the glory of God for our own way. Paul the Apostle, in my favorite, perhaps probably my favorite book of the Bible, the book of Romans, 
talks about all of these things. And right in the beginning, he lays it out this way as you read in Romans chapter 1. And this is just the first little paragraph. Romans 1, starting with verse 21, records this. Paul, by the Holy Spirit, talking about humanity. For, although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Now, claiming to be wise, right, they, by choice, became fools. And, here's the word, exchanged. The glory of God exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images Resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. The basis of sin is exchanging who God is for something less than who He is. God, I know that you're way and you're holy and all that, right? And see who He is, but God, you know what? I'd rather have this than you. You guys catch the the evil nature of this? It's not honoring God and his divine perfection. It's saying to God, God, I'd rather have my sin than follow you. I want to exchange you for something I think is better, so then we exalt something else higher than God. That's what sin is doing. Well, the Ten Commandments started out, you shall not have any God before me. Why? Because there's nothing greater than He is. And sin is just exchanging Him for something else. Right? And saying, you know what, God, thanks, but no thanks. I'd rather have this. That's, in essence... What sin is, it is the exchange of God for something else. The truth of God for a lie. This is why we read about Jesus when he said and he exclaimed, he said, listen, if you love anything more than me, you are not worthy of me. There's truth to that. Yet we all, Scripture reveals, have fallen short of God's glory. And that Scripture again says, this is Romans, 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 no one is righteous. Not even one. Jesus also declared the same thing, saying, no one's good except God alone. So when we ask the question, (laughs) how can a loving God, right? Hopefully we have a better definition of that. Send people to hell. It assumes that people are innocent, I think a better question is, how could a holy God admit anyone into heaven? By asking, how can a loving God send anyone to hell? We have an overinflated value of our own righteousness. And so we accuse God of wrongdoing, not understanding God, nor not, nor not understanding our own sinfulness. In order for there to be good news, we must understand the bad news. And the bad news is really, really 
bad. And in contrast, the good news is really, really good. In undermining our own sin nature and over-exalting our own filthy righteousness, we do a discredit and we believe a lie. We do a discredit to the truth of God and believe a lie about ourselves. And the key to entering the kingdom is first to understand the nature of God and second to understand our nature. How could a holy God admit anyone into heaven? That's a better question. And to this question, Jesus responds, I am the way. I am the way. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 records this for us. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Romans 5, 8, where God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In order to fully and rightly understand the nature of God and our nature, we have to understand who we are. And then again, in contrast, understand the greatness of God and Jesus saying, I am the way. Sinless perfection, the word made flesh, dwelling among us, being tempted in every way we are yet without sin. And then Jesus, who could have walked back into heaven on his own merit, standing in front of the gatekeeper, the judgment seat of God, he would have been declared completely innocent based upon the evidence and the intention of his life, could have walked in on his own. And yet... The love and the wisdom and the sovereignty and the mercy and the goodness and the love of God compelled the Son of God to be made in the likeness of a human who was human and also divine, chose. To pay the penalty, to stand in the gap like only he could because he was the only one righteous. To take the punishment that was due us on himself. So that if we are then in him, believe in him See him as our advocate, God's love and justice are both seen. He, because of our sin, takes our punishment so that we can be set free. That is in essence the heart, the gospel. And there's no one like Jesus. Buddha did not die for your sins. Muhammad did not die for your sins. And if you think that God is obligated to let you in because you're a little better than you are evil... Sorry, God doesn't grade on a scale, right? It's not a bell curve. Hey, way to go. 53%, barely made it, but you passed. Not how it works. 
It's not like you're standing in front of a judge in court and you've committed evil, but your defense is, well, judge, I know I killed that person, but look, I helped out at Fish Able Thanksgiving. That should count for something. And I send my mom a birthday card every year, right? You're still guilty, regardless of what you do over here. This is why this had to happen the way that it did happen, because of the divine and perfect nature of God. He can't be less than what he is. And we have to understand who we are and our need of. Someone to stand in the gap for us because of our unrighteousness. And y'all, I love you, need Jesus, right? We're all unrighteous. And I'll start. Thirdly, we're going to talk about this. The assured nature of eternity. So again, talking about looking to answer this question, how can a loving God send people to hell? That's understanding who God is, what love is, understanding who we are. <laughs> Fallen. Hell, let's talk about this. There's books written on it, but I'm just talking about eternity, right? So here is what Scripture reveals about what happens after you and I die. By the way, the death rate has always hovered around 100%. Okay. I say this tongue-in-cheek, but it's true. None of us are getting out of here alive. Let that sink in. We're all going to die. So what happens after you die? I hope you've asked that question. It is a good question to ask. And there's, of course, lots of speculation. But let me tell you what Scripture makes clear. Hebrews 9, verse 27. And just as it is appointed... For a man or woman to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Let's just stop right there. Okay? This is what Scripture reveals. How many times are you going to die? Once, unless you're Lazarus, right? But Lazarus, by the way, died again, right? Wasn't a resurrection. There's a difference, by the way. Coming back to life is different than a resurrection. Jesus will never die again. We're looking forward, forward to the resurrection. So it's appointed to die, man, a person to die one time, okay? Which then rules out what? Reincarnation, right? Rules that out. It rules out a lot of things. It says, well, after that comes judgment. Well, who's judging? What does that mean? Well, what if I don't believe in God? I want to tell you this, that your belief does not create reality. I can believe that if I went out into the street, that if a bus hit me, I would be perfect. I believe it, therefore it is. And then what if I stepped out into the street as a bus came? What's going to hit me? The truth, right? <laughs> we don't believe things to make it true. Something is true, so therefore we believe it. Right? The truth isn't Determine it upon your belief. Well, I don't believe that. Doesn't mean it's less true, right? It's appointed for a person to die once after that judgment. 
And then it goes on to say, Christ has been offered to bear the sins of many. He's going to come a second time. This is what Scripture tells us about the future, about eternity. Not the first time he came to deal with sin. He died on the cross. The second time, he's coming back as Savior to save us from what? The wrath of God that is due us because of our sin. And God in his justice and his love must merit what is due us. That's why Christ is the Savior, right? This is what Scripture reveals is going to happen. There's no getting around it. There's no, again, misrepresentation of the truth or any corruption in the judge. You're not going to pull the wool over his eyes. You may fool, fool people for some time. You may fool all people, right? But you'll never fool God, Not going to pull a fast one on him. The day of judgment matters. And I want to say that day, the day of judgment matters more than every day. And every day matters on that day. Martin Luther, who was a great church reformer, he lived in light of that reality and said, There are only two days on my calendar, today and that day. As far as I am concerned, this is biblical thinking. If you think knowing that there's going to be a final test that every person, according to Scripture, is going to give an accounting of themselves, if you think about that day, In light of this day, you will live in a way that that day is on your mind so you think and act and live differently. And you also praise God, hopefully gratefully, knowing that you're in Him. A lot more to unpack with that. But this is the reality that scripture says of eternity. Now, Jesus, by the way, talked more about heaven and hell than any other person in the Bible. Did you know that? And there has been reconstructionists who are trying to say, well, heaven is really this and hell is really that. All of these debates. But if you look at the words of Jesus, Jesus described both heaven and hell as a place. Right? Jesus said that he came from heaven, and to heaven he will ascend. And I have all of these in your notes with the scripture passages. Please look them up. Right? He says he will return from heaven to, za- to save those who were waiting for him. Acts 11, Hebrews 9, John 14. And whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. John, of course, 3.16. And for those who exchange the glory of God for something else, those who refuse to repent of their sins and deliberately keep on sinning, all that is left, according to Scripture, is a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. In John chapter 3, again, the verse that we know and the world loves, right, and we hold on to, and rightly so, John 3, 16, if you continue to read the interaction, down in John 3, 36, it says, Jesus, it says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Good news. And whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But... The wrath of God remains on him or her. So what we're talking about today is of eternal significance. It is serious. It is serious. And I don't want you to take this lightly. Most of you, I trust, understand these things. And I hope that 
You treasure Jesus more than anything else. Hear me now. If someone tells you, hey, I'm a Christian, what does that mean? A better question or a good ask, question to ask them is, do you treasure Jesus more than anything else? Do you treasure his word higher than all things? Is Jesus the center of your life? I'm afraid, perhaps in this congregation and in our nation and in our world, that people see Christianity as adding Jesus to their life instead of making Jesus the center of their life. Adding Jesus to our life, we say, well, I'm the center and I'm adding Jesus because Jesus is going to help me. And if he doesn't help me, then I'll find somebody else or something else or whatever. But I'm the center, I'm adding Jesus too. And that's not conversion and that's not the gospel. The gospel is a great exchange. His life for my life. That he is Lord. He is on in the driver's seat. He is the one at the center of me. And I live to know him, to honor him, to follow him, and to be found in him. That's a Christian. Do you treasure Christ above all? all things granted you say well i don't know sometimes most of the time i'm saying is he your center doesn't mean you don't sin wish that was the case but you always return back to him you're living to honor him you look to treasure him you love him more than anything 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 So the question is an important question. Not necessarily the question of <laughs> in a loving, how could a loving God send people to hell? Loving God can sell people to hell because love in nature holds people accountable and God is much more than love. People in their essence have trespassed, have sinned, has exchanged the truth of God for a lie. We are fallen and we're deserving of judgment. Grace comes in where Christ took our place and that in him we'll have life. Without him we do not have life. The centrality of the gospel. And so we're going to do two things right now. One, I'm going to give you an invitation. If you have not received Christ as your Savior, the truth is you are under the wrath of God for the punishment of your sin. I'm just going to put it that bluntly. All that's left is judgment. You're that person and you could say today, I want to trust Jesus as the center of my life toyed around Christianity. You may have attended this church for years. You're here for whatever reason. But if you want Jesus, say, I'm saying yes to Jesus today to follow him, to ask him for forgiveness of my sin. There's acknowledgement of who we are. Commit, ask for forgiveness, commit to follow him, to receive new life. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. Second, we're going to have communion. And that is for us to renew our commitment to Christ and recognition for what he did. Give him thanks to say, yes, I'm following you. I'm in you. You are in me. And it's a renewing of our faith. It's a holy thing we do. Scripture says that we have to examine ourselves before we do this. To see if we truly are in the faith. So let's pray. Why don't we bow our heads right now? And if you say, hey, Dave, hey, Pastor, I today want to commit my heart to Christ. 
that I want to be found in him. I want to treasure him. I understand my sinful nature. I understand God's great love. I want to be found in him and commit myself to him that he would be the center of my life. Today you say, that, that's me, and I want to make that commitment today. So what I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand so I can see it. And I'm asking you to do that right now. You're saying, I am committing myself to Christ, okay? Okay, I see you back there, right? Amen. Okay, see you here, see you here, see you here. Okay, see you back there, okay? Okay, see you right there, yep, I see you. Okay. So God, thank you for my brothers and sisters, God, who today... Yeah, I need you, Jesus. God, thank you for your great love and your mercy. Thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your conviction and your grace. And God, you know their heart and what they're saying this morning. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. God, thank you for my uh, friends this morning have responded that way. Your children, God, I ask that they would know the joy of your salvation. God, I ask that they be enfolded into a congregation, this congregation. Thank you for newness of love and life this day. Weekend before Thanksgiving, God, I give you thanks. Hold them in your presence. Guide them in the truth. God. Help us to love each other well and continue to grow. Guide them for, and excuse me, protect them from the enemy as well. And God, for the rest of us who are here today, I ask that you would continue to guide us into your truth. Continue to show us your goodness and your grace, God. Continue to discipline us in your love because you love us. That we as your people would cherish you and treasure you above all things. Thank you for what you've revealed in your son. Thank you for what you revealed by your spirit. Thank you for what you've given by your word. Thank you for the promise that we have in you we acknowledge who you are, Jesus, and we say, come quickly. And until then, we live to, and help us to live to, honor you. We commit ourselves anew this day, in Jesus' name, amen.